Hi, good evening. Uh, welcome to this session uh, regarding the United Nations World Water Quality Alliance. My name is uh, Dr. Richard Elman. I'm the head of politics of Eurocat, and I will be presiding uh, this evening's session uh, in which are participating a number of colleagues who are working uh, very closely with the purpose of the United Nations World Water Quality Alliance. Which, is, which has been created under the umbrella of the United Nations and uh, Envi uh, Environment Program, or UNEP, and also the United Nations Environment Assembly. This is uh, a organization which constitutes a voluntary global expert, practitioner, and policy network. Um, the principal objective is to assist the global community in addressing key water quality issues of both socio-political and an environmental concern. The World Water Quality Alliance and the social engagement platform, which forms part of the work of this alliance, are seeking to evolve a broad spectrum of organizations, administrations and individuals in what is intended to be a global initiative so that we can truly increase awareness regarding the issue of water quality and we want to unite both the talent, the energy and the enthusiasm of everyone concerned so that we can produce tangible evidence of progress towards the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 6.3. Sustainable Development Goals being the key objective plan of the United Nations in order to truly address the sustainability issues of the plan as a whole. What has been clearly demonstrated since the beginning of this century is that there exists a need to promote, to disseminate and to implement broad supranational policies but through regional and perhaps even more importantly, municipal administrations, so that we can ensure a tangible, practical initiative and a series of results based on the co-creation at a local level. It is important that everybody is involved in such a co-creation process, involving all the elements of what many people call the quintuple helix, the public sector, the private sector, citizens, the research sector, and even the culture themselves. What is important now is that all of these elements can become socially directly connected to the issue of water. One of the most important, if not the most important themes of the 21st century but which due to the very nature is sometimes very invisible to the man in the street, to the general public as a whole. The participation of organizations such as ASCAME and its members around the Mediterranean are absolutely vital if the World Water Quality Alliance is to be truly effective in the Mediterranean region. And this constitutes a marvelous opportunity for the Mediterranean region to become a global leader in this issue. In order to study the global issue of water, we have invited a number of very high level speakers who it is my pleasure now to introduce. Bern Gavrik is of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Andrea Steiner works for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Paul Orengo is director of the African Minister's Council on Water and Angela Odigara is working with the World Wildlife Fund uh, based in Germany. So what I would like to do first of all is to ask each of them to see what their specific perspective on the global issue of water is. And so it's my pleasure to first of all introduce a very close friend of mine Dr. Bernd Gavik to speak on behalf of the Joint Research Center. Bernd. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to share some of um, my insights here. Um, now, let's talk a moment about water. 
Um, today, mankind extracts clean water from natural resources and we use it. And normally, when it's returned to the nature, it usually has lots of, lost its purity. We do this uh, more and more in exchanging climate. Um, the summers are getting longer and hotter. And uh, we understand that uh, we cannot continue anymore what we are doing. You are in Spain in a country which knows this very, very well. You have been forerunners. You are forerunners in technology uh, on reusing, for instance, treated wastewater or making irrigation more efficiency. But we understand that all these efforts are not enough. And um, if we look on the Mediterranean, one of the questions which, which come to our mind is that these are situations which the Mediterranean has seen in, in its past and the area coped with it, or whoever was in charge had to leave the stage and let room for somebody else. The challenge we are facing today is whether we are able to bring our scientific technological know-how to such employment among the society that we can actually for better development. Or in other ways, if we can answer, the question if sustainability is something which is just a dream or it is something which economically makes sense, is viable and allow us to prosper in the 21st century. And uh, I'm, I'm quite interested to see in this discussion um, of today on what are our joint ideas and visions, how to engage with the general public and develop this idea um, in a way that the very uh, economic pattern of the Mediterranean, which are small and medium-sized enterprises, which I understand you, some of you represent, um, can strive for a better future. And with that, uh, I would like to listen to the others. Over to you, Richard. I apologize. I see that I had my microphone off there. Um, so thank you very much, Ben, for that, for that very concise uh, introduction to your perspective. We'll be coming to you later on uh, with further questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Andreas Steiner. Andreas is Swiss, uh, but we won't hold that against him. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing his perspective uh, from Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Andreas, over to you and welcome. Thanks a lot, Richard. So yeah, I, I would like to, I'm, I'm very pleased to be present in this conversation. Thanks a lot for having me here on, on this panel, Richard and, and colleagues. Um, yeah, I, I would like to provide you with a, with a more generic appreciation on, on what why Switzerland, for example, uh, sees uh, water as a, as a global issue and, and what we're trying to do about that. And, and I think you, you might ask yourself, what, what is this Swiss guy doing here? But I try to explain a little bit what, what, what's the connection also with, you know, with the Mediterranean region as a geographical entity and so on. And yeah, in that sense, um, I'm, I'm glad to, to provide a few words. So First of all, it's it's very clear to all of us that water concerns all of us. Uh, so it's everywhere and we all need it every day. So we need it for the morning hygiene, we need it for the coffee and the tea in the morning, industries and production facilities require uh, water. We need water to produce energy, um, we need it to grow food uh, and hand washing. Um, we uh, have been reminded very dramatically about the importance of hand washing in, 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 uh, with the ongo ongoing pandemic. Um, we need water for drinking. And basically water is in almost all the pro products that we consume every day. So it's vital to life and sustainable developments, but water is also at risk. It's unevenly distributed between countries and regions. And there is an, a steep increase in competition between different users and sectors. And this results in overuse, this results in pollution, and all of that um, uh, bears quite severe uh, public health risks. And it also puts our economy at risk. 
So since the 1980s, water use has been increasing globally about at about 1% every year. And that's been because of a combination of population growth, socioeconomic development and changing consumption patterns. So we see a 40% increase in water use in recent decades, and this is expected to continue. So by 2030, we expect that more than 40% of the world's population will be living in severely water stressed river basins. And as you well know, that uh, some of the, among the global hotspots of water stress are the Middle East and the Mediterranean regions. And in these regions, water related risks are increasing and they are in particular likely also to harm poor popula population segments disproportionately. So sustainable access to water sanitation and hygiene, for example, remains a dream for many people on this planet. So this has been, uh, we have been reminded of this in, 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 the, in the current pandemic that's about the essential role of hand washing to spread, to control the spread of the virus. But accessing facilities with water and soap at home is out of reach for, for more than 40% of the world's population, which is about 3 billion people. Sustainable access to water, sanitation and hygienes, hygiene are key determinants to health and they, it contributes to secure global public health by limiting the spread of many lethal diseases. Water is one of the greatest challenges of our time. It is also a global issue and that is why the world has set itself an ambitious water goal for 2030. Uh, in the frame of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And therein, we, the world is calling for a collective effort to shape a new world driven by sustainable development. And it is with this positive vision that Switzerland has long been committed to the cause of water. So, for example, um, the case for international water cooperation is strong for Switzerland. We share rivers with our neighbors uh, and aquifers, uh, some, some call Switzerland the water tower of Europe. So there is abundant water, one may, may think. But, you know, nowadays uh, we live in a very service-oriented economy. And that means that more than 80% of the water we consume in Switzerland is imported virtual water from other regions. And much of that is actually coming from, for also from the Mediterranean regions. Or countries, if I think uh, about Spain or Italy, if I think about the the, the, the veggies and, and and the fruits that that I buy in the supermarket, so collaborating over shared resources requires certain political compromises, but it also provides enormous gains for all sides involved. Um, water cooperation ensures economic prosperity. It fosters resilience to climate change. It creates trust trust between actors and it enhances stability and also in particular also economic stability. So water related challenges like floods, pollution or water scarcity in our interconnected world, they both have, have local and global impacts. And so Switzerland uh, has an interest in and a responsibility to contribute to resolving water issues. And this includes tackling water risks related to imported goods, as I mentioned before, but, but not only not by refusing to purchase goods from, from other countries, but by promoting tools and, and technologies that foster efficient use of water, improve water quality and good water governance. And with that, we try to con contribute to sustainable use of water resources. And this not only improves, reduces our water risk here in Switzerland, it also improves uh, the situation of local communities. Water is also a growing source of conflict and conflicts over water, both within countries and between countries are sharply increasing. In 2018 alone, water was a major trigger of conflict in at least 45 countries. And there is a a risk of, of water turning into a major source of tension, and that is very real. But there is also a potential to make water a key instrument for cooperation and a driver of peace, stability, prosperity and healthy societies. 
And that, among other reasons, is why we support the World Water Quality Alliance. And that is also why we have de developed the Blue Peace approach of promoting water cooperation with a view to preventing conflict and find common solutions on water for the benefit of all. So together with other actors, we are committed to bring water solutions, to bring forward solutions to the water crisis. And that's why we support and engage with the World Water Quality Alliance. And we are also contributed, uh, Switzerland also contributed a lot to making water a goal of the 2030 agenda. And to make this water vision a reality, effective engagement with all actors, including the private sector, both as an enabling partner, but also as, a, as a, a player that needs to be held accountable is indispensable. There is an urgent need to come up with new development instruments and partnerships like the World Water Quality Alliance. And together, the public and private sectors can foster sustainable development and investments by sharing some of the associated high risks and costs or by engaging in joint initiatives to actively promote sustainable development. Thank you. Back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, thank you very much for, for pointing out so many really vital elements, which is one of the reasons, which are many of the reasons why we're here today and many of the reasons why uh, together so many organizations have come together to create the World Water Quality Alliance. One of those organizations, uh, an extremely important member of the World Water Quality Alliance, is that that is represented today by Paul Oringo. Paul Oringo is here representing AMCAO, which is the African Minister's Council of Water. Uh, Paul, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk. Welcome and uh, good evening or good afternoon. Good evening, Richard, and many thanks for the opportunity. Uh, very briefly, I will share my thoughts from the African lenses. In Africa, we consider water security to entail both quantity and quality aspects. As you may know, Africa is actively participating in the World Water Quality Alliance, and our participation is due to the unique setup in the design and discharge of its mandate that stimulates and facilitates peer learning among countries and regions on water quality issues as a critical element of water security. Africa is also actively participating in the World Water Quality Alliance platform because of its deliberate objective of promoting knowledge and information exchange on matters of water quality between the global North and South. This, as you can imagine, gives us as Africa the opportunity and the leverage to tap into some of the world's best approaches and tools for addressing water quality challenges. In that regard, Africa considers the Medi Mediterranean as being significant in the drive to stimulate collective action in addressing water quality issues globally. Mediterranean is an important pillar in the global axis that we believe cannot stay out of the World Water Quality Alliance. Therefore, Africa wants the Mediterranean to be part of the World Water Quality Alliance so that we can learn from them. But we also want the Mediterranean to understand the unique challenges that we face and how we design local solutions to those challenges as a continent. If I may be more specific, the social engagement platform of the World Water Quality Alliance is one such innovative approach that is being applied by the Alliance to ensure that no one is left behind. Indeed, there is no passive stakeholder when it comes to water issues. Every voice matters, and every voice and everyone counts. We are all affected by water quality issues in one way or the other. In conclusion, therefore, the World Water Quality Alliance platform is a movement. This is a movement of change makers, a movement of thought leaders, and a movement of doers brought together by the urgent need 
to ensure that the world achieves sustainable development goals and especially sustainable development goal number six and its subsidiary targets related to water quality. And so as the African representative, mine is a call to action and a call to each one of you present here today to please join, join us, join this team in making the world a better place by addressing water quality issues together. Thank you, Richard and fellow panelists. Thank you very much, Paul. Always a pleasure to have you with us. And now I'd like to introduce the uh, last speaker of the afternoon, but by no means the least. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Angela Otigarra, and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Angela at present is working for the World Wildlife Fund, and I believe is actually located in Germany. Is that correct, Angela, or have I got that, or is it Holland? Netherlands. It's the Netherlands. Okay, I, I had yeah. a. Yeah, I often get confused confused between the two. Welcome, Angela, and over to you. Okay, so um, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And I want to approach the importance of water quality from a different angle, um, which is the freshwater species. So um, WWF launched the report um, some, I think, some months ago, and it's the Living, um, Living Planet report. And in this report, we saw that uh, there was a collapse of 84% of the population of freshwater species. And we also have in that report that the wetlands, the inland wetlands, they lost an air, about 30% of its area over the past 30 years, which is an enormous amount. Like, think about um, having 100%, 100 animals and then 84 of them are dead in 30 years. So it's 84% of the population of freshwater species that is already lost. And so it makes that the freshwater ecosystems are the most impacted ones worldwide. And water quality is one of the main factors that affect the life of this uh, species. We can think about, for example, the mining activities in the Amazon River and how it's impacting the Amazon River. But in general, the industrial activities or even the growth of urban settlements, if um, wastewater is not properly treated, as um, it is pointed out in SDG 6.3.1, then we are going to have an impact in ambient water quality, which is SDG 6.3.2. So we in WWF, we, have, um, we recognize the importance of water quality, and we engage it in the World Water Quality Alliance to increase the awareness about this importance and to help countries to take action. In the report that I just mentioned, we have uh, six um, steps that are an emergency recovery plan. And those six steps, they can be applied different in different uh, countries. But in general, they are very beneficial also for the Mediterranean countries. So I'm going to mention them. One is to allow rivers to flow more naturally and restore the hydrological regimes that we had in the past. The second one is to reduce pollution. The third one is to protect uh, wetland habitats, because we saw we had the loss of 30% of inland wetlands in 30 years. And then we have to end overfishing and unsustainable sand mining. And when I think about overfishing, I think that was discussed a lot in this week in the Mediterranean, um, during this week, uh, uh, talking about the Mediterranean uh, oceans. Oh, yeah, <laughs> ocean. Uh, and then also controlling, in, controlling invasive species is probably something that was also discussed during this and restoring the connectivity of rivers. So remo removing dams that are not used anymore and all of that together, uh, it would help to increase uh, the health of these freshwater ecosystems and as consequence also of the species. But all this transformation requires engagement and we as WWF, I, can, I will sit one example of a work we are doing in Turkey uh, that is in the Buyuk Menderes Delta. So how do we engage people? How do we try to engage people to work around and to improve uh, water quality, for example? We selected the approach that is called water stewardship. So we try to engage private sector in this market transformation. 
and the work we do is in the Buyuk Menders Delta, so it is in the south east Anatolia, I think, in Turkey. And um, in this basin, we have uh, on the um, upstream of the basin, we have the textile sector, and then downstream we have cotton production. So we have two important aspects of the textile um, sec su sector supply chain. Uh, the Buyukmenders Basin is uh, responsible for 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 forty percent, sixty percent of the exports of textile in Turkey, and also for fourteen percent of the production of cotton. So it's not only important; um, it's important nationally as an economic hub for the country. But that's not only that. That area has two important uh, wetlands. One is the Buyukmenders Delta. National Park, and it has um, it's one of the five breeding spots of the Dalmatian pelican, and the other one is uh, the Lake uh, Bafa Lake, and that uh, it's this home for the endangered European eel. So both habitats are very important from the uh, ecological perspective, from bio the, the biodiversity perspective, if, and they are being they've been um, under pressure because of water pollution and this water pollution is coming not only from the textile industry but also from other industry but as wwf we uh, started working with the textile industry to improve uh, the production at uh, so at the private sector inside of the facilities to help them to have better process that will lead to uh, mm, a wastewater that is after treat uh, is treated before being released to the river so in very practical terms. And also, we work with regenerative agriculture uh, for the cotton production. So those actions, um, even if we uh, succeed in having a very clean textile industry, very clean co cotton production, that will probably not be enough for um, the basin itself to be clean. Because as I mentioned, there are other industries there is also uh, population growth, so there is a need of domestic wastewater treatment, but it's a, it's a first step. And so what I see, uh, the beauty of the this work that we are doing is what we call collective action. So we need the commitment of several stakeholders. And while our ambition, uh, we are very ambitious in the tasks we have, we need to recognize that um, there may be a lack of technical uh, capacities, financial capacities. So putting the, the stakeholders together to discuss how they can help each other is a way to increase the effectiveness of their work. So when we talk about um, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean countries uh, joining such a thing like the World Water uh, Quality Alliance, we believe that that will make um, uh, them stronger to understand the sources of pollutions and to tackle them together in a way that we will uh, be able to integrate the actions and then have a major benefit for the freshwater ecosystems, for other quality and for the communities and so on. So um, I hope that was um, clear on how we approach the whole issue of uh, water quality. And uh, back to you, Richard. And uh, uh, thank you again for that introduction. Thank you all of you for a very, very clear and precise introduction. I'd like to now come back uh, to you uh, with a, a number of aspects which I think we've got uh, time to explore, which I think that uh, people who are listening in would be interested to know. Now, then, the Mediterranean, those of us who live on the shores of the Mediterranean, I live here uh, in uh, Spain, in the, in the northeast part of Catalonia, uh, those of us who live in the Mediterranean are very aware of the history of this sea. We are very much aware of the importance of the past, of the amount of uh, culture that has been created here, uh, and how really the, the history of civilization, the history of uh, mankind, has very much had uh, the emphasis and its focus based around the shores of the Mediterranean itself. Um, with regards to water, with regards to environmental issues, uh, much of what um, 
we must apply, surely, in the future, uh, must come from lessons in the past. Uh, Winston Churchill was famously quoted as saying that I know what's going to happen because I've read history. Uh, Bernd, Bernd Gavlik, uh, how important do you think that with regards to the issue of water, uh, the past uh, plays in our ability to confront the future? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, it, is, it is interesting that you're asking this question because when you were talking in your introduction about the quintuple helix, I, I, I thought about that, that question. Now, let me give you an example and, and, and uh, starting from the past. Um, and let me start, and this is also very important, showing you the importance of the Mediterranean. Let me start with an invention from Africa, from Northern Africa, which is the Sakia. The Sakia is a device, some of you may know it, which was designed 2000 years ago in, 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 in Egypt and which boosted agriculture because it allowed to transport water for irrigation in an, unfor an unprecedented way until the moment of its invention. Now, this invention, invention crossed, of course, the Mediterranean back and forth, um, sometimes with military conquerors bringing their technology, sometimes simply because people were scientists and brought the knowledge they discovered places. And it reached, us uh, in doing so, um, the north of Italy, where I am living here close to Milan, uh, where there was a guy um, in the Renaissance period whose name was Gianello Turiani. He is famous also in Spain because he was advisor to, uh, to the Spanish king. He was uh, famous for a number of inventions, but he used this technology and built the irrigation system, which allowed the city of Cremona to flourish, to develop agriculture and to become one of the most important players in the, play, in the Po um, uh, Valley in the Renaissance period. And if you look today on some of the invention, inventions which are using water-powered um, distribution systems for agriculture, they are still based on the same principle. Now, this is very important when you are trying to bring this technology back to the people because it is clear that I cannot sit in an office in Brussels and tell, for instance, now a farmer in Spain, oh, please, you cannot grow any more tomatoes because my models in Brussels tell you you are going to run out of water. But if I find something, a common ground of understanding of an event in the past, which is culturally embedded uh, in, the, in, the, in the local community, then I can start to use this example and show that actually there has been a solution in the past already who was developed by the people. And it is very likely that the acceptance, as a matter of fact, will be guaranteed. And you can see this, for instance, we are talking here uh, in an, an event organized uh, addressing the Catalan region. This is the case, for instance, when it comes to the reuse of water. You are living in an area where you are used to this technology. And normally, there is no debate about reusing your treated wastewater. You may have discussions about uh, the quality standards, but the technology per se is actually uh, widely accepted. So this element of culture in the, in the quintuple helix is somewhat different from the four others. I like to use the image that academia, the public, the private sector, and the citizen, they have to sit on a table called culture. Because culture is the grounds on which you will develop um, the consensus, and it is also the possibility to allow the non-expert to articulate his or her fears and concerns through arts. And in this way, you are getting actually into a dialogue, which is the basis for a compromise and for um, the develop you need. Um, and, and in this sense, I think the Mediterranean is unique. It, 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 it brings together three continents. We, we tend to forget this. Uh, in particular, we Europeans tend to forget this. There's a lot of knowledge which has been brought to us from Africa. There's a lot of knowledge which has been brought to us from Asia. And if we recognize that we are peers, the same partners on the same level, then we might be up to the challenge which we have in front of us. And which means for the Mediterranean by 2030 that we will have 600 million people living here, 600 million mouths to feed, and 600 million people which under a climate change scenario must learn to do more with less. Over to you, Richard. 
Thank you, Bernd. Um, and uh, uh, a good point, extremely well made, if I may say so. Let me now open up the, the discussion to, to everybody here and let me plant some questions uh, to you. Uh, by the way, talking of questions, if there is anybody who is listening who wishes uh, to be able to uh, ask something to a member of the panel or to the whole panel, uh, please uh, please pass your messages on and uh, we will uh, pass those uh, to the panelists themselves. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what is sustainability. Um, uh, a lot of the people who will be listening in this evening uh, represent um, uh, chambers of commerce, they represent industry, and they represent especially the sector of small and medium-sized enterprises, which undoubtedly is the backbone of the Mediterranean economy. When we talk about sustainability, um, sometimes those who are, shall we say, uh, nature-based or natural-based think of sustainability only in terms of environmental issues. On the other hand, when we're talking about sustainability, those who are economists would be thinking more about financial issues. How do we marry these two concepts? How do we make both uh, actions both green and at the same time economically sustainable? And how possible is that and how realistic is that uh, in the Mediterranean era? Perhaps I could start with Andreas. Well, thanks, Richard. I think a, a, a tricky question for me, who is who is the the, the, the guy not from the Mediterranean. So, um, um, yeah, I I think I mean one of the the main things that we need to to provide as as a group of actors that it is trying to drive um, the, the the sustainable development agenda from a holistic perspective, let's say, economy, environment, and social aspects. Um, I think one of the, the key things that, that we can provide is, is, is spaces for dialogue for the people. Um, I think that's, that's one of the very important things and that's at the heart of, of, of the World Water Quality Alliance. So the, the idea is to bring together a very diverse set of people um, from be it local, local businesses, small, small and medium sized enterprises, um, be it local research institutes or um, even, I mean, multinational organizations like the UN can be involved and, 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 and also very grassroots, uh, of course, grassroots civil society organizations and politicians and so on. Um, I think providing this platform, uh, which is independent from, 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 let's say, more formalized policy processes that can can provide the the space where people can come together and and talk as as was mentioned by by uh, burned before so i think um yeah certainly that's that's certainly what we're trying to do and that's where i see a lot of potential to also engage with the private sector with the local private sector because as as richard said it is the it, it is in particular the, the local private sector that that we need to talk to. We do, we, it, I mean, there's a lot of talk going on with, with multinationals and multinational corporations, uh, and they're cleaning up their supply chains because they have to, um, because pressure is, is, is growing and they, they face reputational risks and so on. So with, with them, it's, 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 it's kind of easy, I would say. There's a lot of challenges. It's, it's not at all easy, but I mean, it's much more easy than, than engaging uh, at the very local level with all the, the different players that have very diverse interests. But there is, at, at one point, we also need to start. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that the, the way the world water quality is approaching it, it can really contribute to, to, to make those changes last because we are trying to give it into the hands of the local people. So just basically providing the space for people to take action. Andreas, uh, thank you for your interesting point. I think indeed it is true that uh, all too often in the past, um, the, the large funding agencies, for example, the European Commission, which is an obviously an extremely important entity uh, affecting the Mediterranean. Uh, Bernd himself here represents the Joint Research Centre of the European 
Uh, very often, uh, these funding organizations, they tend to look at large scale projects because it's sometimes a lot easier to control rather than numerous small projects. Nevertheless, uh, it is also true that those small projects on the ground, uh, shall we say sometimes at a local level, can often prove just as effective and in fact uh, economically far more sustainable as well. But that's a very good point that you made there, uh, Andreas. Uh, Paul, perhaps I can pass the question over to you. Uh, how do we balance the, the question of, shall we say, a transition to a green economy? Um, this is something which the, the European Union themselves talk a lot about. I know that African countries as well are extremely concerned about a transition to a green and digital economy. How can we do that and make it at the same time both economically sustainable, able to create more employment, and yet at the same time become and have a positive effect on the environment? Paul, over to thank you. you Richard. Thank you, thank you, Richard. I, I think that is a, a very um, interesting question. Uh, African economies are actually um, maybe not so much at their infancy, but are so much at their development stage. Uh, I, I say that because African countries and African economies um, are generally strong, very much dependent, especially on manufacturing. Uh, on the global north. But at the same time, the um, level, the rapid development and investments that are happening uh, needs to ideally ensure that it directly relates and uh, swings around the natural environments as its uh, kind of sustainability uh, strategy. Uh, I think natural environments, uh, anything around water, ecosystems, name it, uh, is going to drive how Africa shapes its, develop its development, especially by the year 2050, when Africa's population is expected to probably more than double, and the amount of water resources that will be uh, available in Africa will probably be uh, less and less owing to the rapid you know, demand uh, arising from the need for industrialization, the high uh, population that will be, uh, will need to be uh, provided, you know, will need food and, and many other commercial uses. So as a policy uh, think tank, as AMCAO, I think it is our role to provide and support African countries to uh, design intentional policies that addresses one, how the development agenda, be it on industrialization, commerce in whichever aspect relates to natural environments and particularly water. And two, how that design actually relates to other development blueprints like the Africa's um, Agenda 2063, uh, the Africa we want, the Africa Water Vision 2025, and many other uh, policy uh, frameworks and political pronouncements uh, in a way that the private sector, the populace, the communities, and the governments actually reads and works from a common agenda and from a common principle and a common policy standpoint of sustainability. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, Paul. Um, let me broaden the subject a little bit. I mean, we're talking here about the economy. And as I've already seen in the introduction, um, one of the things that is extremely true is that uh, Mediterranean has been the cradle of so many good things. It's been the cradle of, of many of the concepts of civilization as we know it. Uh, it has been the scene of some of the great rises of some of the great empires and some of the great economic movements. Um, and it's also seen negative things as well. Now then, one of the most important economic activities in the modern world, which has been very strongly affected, uh, unfortunately, over the last 12 months by the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, has been the industry of tourism. I'm sure that uh, a lot of the listeners today are involved in tourism. Uh, tourism obviously has a very, very strong role on the issue of water. Uh, Angela, uh, may I ask you to, first of all, uh, give us some opinions on how you think uh, tourism really must step up and accept its role 
in the to face the challenges that uh, that we must answer with regards to water yeah that's a very very good question um so what we often see which is a pity is that uh tourism is harming in some cases harming the very beauties that people go there to see so by having the awareness that um, if you want to continue having that beauty you need to protect that area uh would already be very um very powerful for example um what we often see and i come from a background of wastewater treatment in the past that big resorts used to big uh, to build uh, big hotels uh, without considering um the where the water would be coming from or where the water would be coming after um they it's used by the tourists now this is coming less and less because the impact of uh these resorts are um, are seen by the population and people stop going actually now people uh, are not going anymore to all the touristic places because of covid but i think this should be seen as a great opportunity to in some cases uh having um limit of visitors for places so some places that are in sensitive areas um I think it would be fair for uh, we would need to strike this balance between having yes the economic development linked to tourism but also the environmental protection and preserving the um, um also the pleasure of being in a natural place so uh I think that one of the things that the, the tourism sector sector needs to speed up is really like considering that um, um, in, the, in the case of water, where is the their water coming from? Is there in this area uh, water shortage? Is the population around that area, is the population having uh, water and sanitation? So all those things are things that may not be directly linked to the tourism itself but uh, increasing the livelihood of the population where these tourist activities happen will help will help in general to approve and con the, uh, the continuation of the touristic activities so um as one example um that comes to mind is um that is growing a lot in the mediterranean now and i think it's very um worth keeping an eye on is the what we call in Italy agriturismo, so it's really like a, um, a tourism that is in in nature. Um, in, uh, in this case, it's like more like farmers, but farms, but that they have a special attention to the tourism. So it's not the mass tourism. Other thing that we can see is um, especially now um, uh, also um, there are so many beautiful places in the Mediterranean that uh, are very sensitive i was talking before about the buyuk menders delta uh, so uh, also in other areas of turkey we have uh, wetlands that need protection so um raising the awareness of the beauty of these areas for yes to uh, attract tourists but having these tourists somehow also to pay for the conservation of those areas could be a strategy to make tourism itself more sustainable and also meeting more than one objective, not only uh, the pleasure of the visitor, but also the needs of the local population and um, improving the economic growth as soon as, of course, we, we can go back to, to normal touristic activities. Thank you, Angela. Now then, uh, it's already been mentioned the importance of engagement and uh, certainly uh, one of the most important uh, areas of the World Water Quality Alliance is the challenge to manage to convert all of the data which is being accumulated uh, as a result of the creation of the World Water Quality Alliance uh, into tangible action and this involves engagement. Um, the social uh, engagement workflow of the World Water Quality Alliance 
is specifically aimed at that, at creating a transformational uh, systemic approach uh, towards uh, co-creation, towards the uh, bringing together all, of all of the members of society, be they professional or non-professional, what we call the quintuple helix, uh, bringing them together so that society as a whole can create a mutual trust between different sectors and therefore a positive uh, atmosphere of collaboration so that we are able to uh, create long-term and effective policies in order to really guarantee the future sustainability, not only of the Mediterranean, but of the, the planet as a whole. Um, my question to all of you is, what role do uh, Mediterranean businessmen, Mediterranean uh, industry, uh, Mediterranean associations and organizations have uh, in the, not only in the creation, but also in the implementation of these policies. Uh, perhaps I could uh, pass that question first of all to you, Paul. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think this is very interesting. Um, so policies uh, by the very nature are uh, designed to provide a um, conducive environment for different players to be able to thrive in whatever. And I, um, as I said in my opening remarks that um, Africa uh, looks at uh, Mediterranean as a very, very critical pillar in the uh, global north and south axis, particularly in terms of learning and uh, making sure that uh, the knowledge and skills transfer between Africa and the global north is uh, exchanged for purposes of benefit, uh, benefiting our water quality and our water management uh, practices. So um, in designing the policy framework, uh, especially for the Mediterranean. I think the private sector has a role in, design, in, in, in uh, advancing the agenda of what it is they need to see and what it is they want to achieve because any policy framework should be able to support and help them propel their uh, goals and objectives. Uh, of course, not without saying that the academia would also need to be the, the researchers to inform based on science and data uh, what the kind of policies that are needed to be able to uh, support the uh, overall water management agenda. And most importantly is what I would call the back end uh, commercial players. Uh, like uh, Andreas uh, mentioned that much of the fruits and vegetables they need uh, in Swiss are actually from other countries. So those kind of uh, exporters and importers, uh, mostly in the financial uh, sector, also needs to be engaged because in one way or the other, they determine the kind of uh, investment uh, environment uh, that prevails. And so in designing that policy, I think it should be private sector driven uh, just to, um, to say so. Uh, so that uh, they thrive and they uh, attain their specific and wider objectives in a manner that is sustainable and, of course, informed by science, uh, leveraged from the uh, academia and research community. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Paul. Let me throw that question open to the others as well. Uh, Burns, you first. Thank you, Richard. Um... I cannot answer this question without referring to the European Green Deal. Um, the European Green Deal, you know what it talks a lot about, the ambitious to make Europe climate neutral. It develops a number of proposals, suggestions, initiatives to do so, farm to fork strategy, biodiversity, um, to name but two. Zero, pollu uh, zero pollution target is another one. All this is nice and very important and needs to be properly funded. Um, but if you don't have the small and medium sized enterprise on your side, you will fail to answer the question, what is the deal for the people locally? And, and this is why, why um, 
this dialogue um, has to be intensified. We have to rethink also about our financial instruments. You made the remark before that we really like to invest into large scale um, prestigious projects. For instance, a wastewater treatment plant for a mega city like Cairo is certainly something which you need. But you have to equally to address, for instance, the diffuse pollution coming from an agricultural area in the south of Spain, which may drain into your groundwater and cause problems over there. Um, and this question cannot be answered by regulation or by laws. They can only be answered by smart business models. And, and this, is, this is actually the challenge for the Mediterranean small and medium-sized sector. Can you come up with new ideas transforming the problem of one uh, neighbor enterprise into an opportunity for you? Let's stick to the simple example of um, tourism, which was mentioned before by, uh, by Angels. Um, if, if you are an operator of a hotel facility in a community on the Costa Brava. You will have to cope with a large demand on water resources. You have a lot of waste to manage, and this for a relatively short period of the year, because most of the time your tourists will come in the summer period and you won't see so many of them in winter. Now, it is clear that if you build in, for, at municipal level an infrastructure to manage this water and waste problems, they will all be oversized for half of the year or undersized for the other half of the year. Now, when it comes to circularity, circular economy, what you have to do, you have to overcome these boundaries between tourism, between the agricultural sector, between the energy or the water sector. And you have to find local viable solutions that not only pay off, but are sustainable. Let me add another important element in this discussion on sustainability. You are right what you said. There are the two elements of environmental sustainability and financial sustainability and viability. But we should not forget about the social viability and sustainability. Because a tourism, where we would believe that only the people who can afford are coming to the Mediterranean, honestly, I don't think this is going to work. So these aspects, social, economic, and environmental, they have to come together, and they have to come to, uh, together um, under the lead of the low, small and medium-sized enterprises in the Mediterranean. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Andreas, Angela, um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that to that section. I could, I could add. I'm not sure I'm muted. So, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly, yes. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> so, um, in, the, um, in the example that I gave about Turkey, uh, one of the, the successes that we had in engaging small medium enterprises um, on the environmental question was uh, to show them the business cases of the actions that they would have to take. For example, you change a machinery um, that we have um, provide uh, let's say at the end of the process a uh, water that is cleaner but uh, in we can also tell them how long um, it's the same the payback time so when we talk to these small medium enterprises we need especially now after covid and in the textile sector that was very much hit, hit by by the, the the pandemic um what we've been doing is really uh, trying to show them that in most of the cases you can get environmental benefits and also economic benefits by applying technologies that are more clean. So this business case is very important. Uh, and what we often do uh, is, uh, especially people are used to do things in a certain way, so sometimes it's very hard to change. What we do is that we engage them and we uh, test some pilots uh, of a new technology and then they can, uh, they can see the results and then after they can decide whether that technology could work for them or not. And the same we are doing um, also for um, agriculture, so for cotton production. Uh, we, the cotton is one of the the cultivations that use more um, chemicals than uh, it uh, uses lots of chemicals 
and we are trying now to uh, talk to farmers uh, in using uh, less chemicals, maybe going to regenerative agriculture, but it's always a process. And I think that um, with the, the support of the World Water Quality Alliance and the support that the, the partners we have currently, those um, specific cases uh, can be identified and we can then uh, propose actions that will, yes, improve the life uh, or the, uh, the production of cotton or the production of textile material, but on the other hand, also have positive impact on the environment. So normally um, uh, in the past, when we would sell it, they would buy a technology, it would be just because that technology would increase their performance. Now we, we have technology that not only increase performance, but they can also increase the environmental um, outcomes. And I think that being able to work in the Mediterranean with different um, uh, with different sectors to identify those opportunities has a great potential uh, to clean the production in SMEs and then therefore uh, have a positive impact in the environment. Okay, thank you, uh, thank Angela. You. Yes, thank you, Ankela, very much. Uh, your microphone was working perfectly. I'm not sure about your sound, but your microphone was working perfectly. <laughs> Andreas, you were going to make a point. Andreas Steyer, yeah, you were uh, making... I mean, yeah, just a uh, very interest, interesting discussion. I, I would add one or two additional elements that, that have not really been mentioned in, in the discussion so far. And one of the key issues that we need to address together with also the private sector is the value of water the valuing of water how do we value it this resource that is so precious and that we all depend on i mean for the time being um most of us probably uh, at least i mean including myself uh, most of us they know how much they pay for for the energy they consume we know how much very very well how much we pay for the smartphone and, 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 and the use of you know to communication and so on but little do we know about you know the how much do we pay for the water that we use uh, every day um, um, and I think that that's something that we need to to address together with with um, with the private sector as well and therefore we need you know we, we need to to raise the voice of water and and the, for the time being i think those water voices are still quite weak um to advocate for for the the recognition of 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 those various values of water for you know social values economic values environmental values and also cultural values it was also be, it has been mentioned before and 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 then also all the interlinkages with other issues such as climate change and agriculture food security food security energy health and so on and i think this is something where the the world water quality alliance wants to contribute to change by providing by also identifying the the, the champions that that the front runners those that are you know that are willing to change the game and and take a little bit a higher cost um, in order to secure, for example, their businesses in the long term, because I mean, the private sector should be should be very much concerned about the water crisis because it puts their businesses at risk, especially in in water stressed uh, regions. And and it is not only technology will not s save us. Uh, not only it's not only technology that will save us. We also need to improve our policies and, and, and the overall governance of the whole thing. Um, and maybe just the, the, the last point, I mean, it, it has been mentioned by An Angela uh, before, I think, uh, how do we engage with, with the private sector? Also with the, with the small and medium sized enterprises, uh, the, the buzzword uh, is water stewardship. And I think, you know, corporate water stewardship, what, what is it actually? And it, I think it is, it is about businesses understanding the risks they face from from water scarcity and pollution in order to take action to help ensure that that the water is managed uh, sustainably as as a, as a shared 
public resource resource and they're thereby assuming responsibility for for the the eco ecological the economic and the social systems that they operate in and in that sense stewardship uh, it goes beyond being just water efficient in in the in the whole production chain um it is about the private sector collaborating with governments with other businesses uh, with ngos with communities with the people to pro protect and promote uh, better water governance for for the benefit of uh, people nature and also the economy and prosperity I think that, that was the, the point I wanted to add. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Andreas. Now, um, something that hasn't really been mentioned yet, but I think is very important to bring up, and I would like to hear the reactions of all of you, is that within the World Water Quality Alliance, and more specifically within the workflow which I'm leading on behalf of both Water Europe and Eurocat, um, it was the, which is the uh, social engagement workflow, um, we are very concerned and we believe it's very important that we bring in uh, the voices of all of the sectors of the society. And that also includes uh, people such as the youth. The youth, after all, we are, when we are addressing these issues, we are talking about uh, not only our present, we're talking very much about their future and the long-term future and the future of their children as well. Uh, another group uh, which comes to mind and which is, after all, more than 50% of the Mediterranean population are women who very often are underrepresented. And I'm saying that looking at this screen and I can see two, uh, two bald, white, middle-aged men. Uh, Paul, who's a, a, young, a young man, but <laughs> and Andreas as well, who's a young man, and only one woman. And that unfortunately, and I do apologize uh, for that, but that unfortunately is very much the situation in the world, not only of water, but in the world of decision taking as a whole. So groups such as the youth, such as women, surely we must bring on board. How do we go about that? How do we target people who very often don't even consider that they themselves have a role to play in the future sustainability of the planet. How do we bring these people on board? Uh, let me open that question to any of you, so don't all rush at once. But let me let me ask it first of all to Bernd, and then please just interrupt him because Bernd needs interrupting more than often. So, Bernd, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, well. Um, uh, criticism to the organizer who selected the panelists because uh, it is certainly something where where you have to start but i mean used or or gender related questions these are questions related very much also to inequalities to to unfairness uh, even to injustice um, now how do we bring these people on board first of all simply by creating the opportunity and then let it happen i think this is this is something which in the alliance ready uh, or we started to do by involving people uh, who are not having the spectacular cv are multilingual uh, 50 years plus uh, with a lot of experience and what have you but that we go to people who are simply in a municipality or on on a grassroots level are really doing things make it happen the second thing is i think you have to allow for failure um, I think one of the problems what we have in the European system in particular when it comes to projects which we are subsidizing is we don't allow failure. This is something which is, is a pity because we see failure as, as a personal failure and not as an opportunity to get things right. Um, now if you want to bring these uh, groups on board you have to allow for it. And, and, and lastly, and with this, I, I would, would like to end, you have to look on the best practices, on the examples that work. Now, what we saw in our work in the World Water Quality Alliance social engagement platform so far is that actually the best projects, the best examples, having all a common feature, they have an equal uh, distribution between male and female colleagues, 
they have an equal distribution between rich and poor, young and old. So it is the biodiversity aspect of these aspect of these projects and, and lighthouse um, examples, which to my opinion are those which are to be, be brought forward and disseminated. And let me be also here very clear. It cannot be that the usual pro projects shown in showcases are coming from huge and large and big cities. Most of the people don't live in such um, high income or high infrastructural privileged settings. Um, so I think it's the small and biodiverse um, ex exercises uh, which are very valuable and which we should um, use in our activity on social engagement. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. And before I pass the word on to the others there, uh, I would like to as well stress something else which is very, very important. I mean, and the the World Water Quality Alliance is obviously a global movement. It's not just about the Mediterranean, but the Mediterranean is extremely important for us. And with regards to the Mediterranean, it's very, very important to stress that this is not a north-south movement, quite the opposite. Um, there is no one region that has the right or indeed the ability or the knowledge to teach or to lecture to another region. What this needs to be is a system of mutual exchange of uh, a difference of expressions of experience and of situations and a coming together and bringing together of the best solutions. But this is not the North teaching the South, nor is it the South teaching the North, nor the East, the West, nor the West, the East. Um, Andreas, over to you with regards to that. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Richard. I mean, I, I appreciate it very much that you raise uh, the, the, the issue of youth, for example, and, and you know it. Um, uh, that is something that is very, very much at my heart. And um, we are, um, we've, we've started to, to actively promote youth empowerment um, a couple of years ago in, in our agency. And what do we mean with that? I mean, this, this it, it starts, of course, with having, you know, selecting your panelists and, and so on. Uh, make sure that uh, the youth gets a voice in, in the panel and so on. But that's not enough. That's, that's just, uh, you know, that's the, the very first step. Very simple. But I think the, the real game changer is to, to empower youth to take decisions and to, to listen to the youth and to, to listen to their solutions. Um, now, what I've learned in the past years by engaging with, with young people from, from all geographies, from literally throughout the world, um, so many countries uh, uh, that, we, that we work with, with youth groups, uh, with, with young entrepreneurs and, and, and young, young parliamentarians and so on, they are very, very knowledgeable. I mean, from from any geography, they know what what the challenge is, and I th I'm I'm really convinced that youth is the is is kind of the key to the sustainable world that we are uh, aiming for, because they have already embedded it in their behavior. Um, I mean, not all of them, of course. It's a very you cannot youth is not one one group it's a very very di diverse uh it's a very diverse uh, universe um but i see so many young people that are really committed that that want to drive change and if you allow them if you let them do it um they will come up with the most amazing solutions that you've you've ever seen and and therefore i mean for example we are supporting young entrepreneurs in the water and sanitation sector um, we do this through uh, calls for applications where they can receive, they can um, uh, pitch their their business ideas uh, to to fill some access gaps in in service provision, in sanitation, for example, or uh, even hygiene and, and and also water provision, where there are gaps in in, in very low income communities, for example. Um, Entrepreneurs can can fill those gaps where 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 you know the, the public provider is not able to do so because the costs are too high or what, whatsoever, um, and these entrepreneurs come up with solutions that that they have everything you know they they are climate smart, 
uh, they are resilient. They they are you know they are economically viable um, and sustainable. They are you know they are also um, investment ready after with, with some support and so on. And and I think this is this is a great thing to do. And and I I'm looking forward to have uh, a very solid youth engagement uh, within the World Water Quality Alliance. And I'm 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 happy to 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 work with all of with all the uh, with everyone who is interested in doing so to achieve that. Yes, I mean I think that that's very very important. And just before I do pass the word over to Paul and to Angela, um, I would stress very much that within the social engagement workflow, what we are looking to do is that we don't want to treat youth as a separate entity. We don't want to put them as, as one person uh, put it, one of the respons people responsible, shall we say, and one of the experts on youth, uh, Joanna Dubresco, who participates in our core team, she actually said, we mustn't create a kiddies table. Uh, we mustn't separate them. Rather, we should encourage them to take the lead and to really take their position as, as uh, one of uh, a group of equals amongst equals. And I think that that's very important. And that certainly goes as well with regards to women and to any other type of uh, social group. Uh, Angela, as the, the, the only lady on the, on the board today, and that is my fault, my apologies. Uh, I wasn't being sexist when I decided to go uh, for only 25% of women representation here. But uh, as, as a woman, uh, how, do you, how do you feel that, about the role that women should assume? Uh, and do you think that women are aware of the fact that they should step up and really take their full role, uh, not only in the issue in the war of water, but in, in the issue of future sustainability as a whole? I think we are getting there. We are getting there to where women have the space to speak their voice. Unfortunately, however, that's not, uh, it happens much more often in, uh, in the north of the world than in the south of the world. So I still see uh, when I work with different teams um, that in some cases, um, I have great women that I work with, but they le they need some little nudging, like for them to speak when in the meeting there there is more men than women, so they feel much more comfortable f talking about uh, among peers. So that's one thing that we need to be aware that we don't create an environment in which women don't feel comfortable with speaking, or they fa feel like looked uh, down to from the white men uh, for the from the men with white hair <laughs> so um, i think that giving more opportunity uh, to women to speak in those uh, in this kind of events but in general uh, in decision tables and um, making sure that when you organize a meeting um, that you have women representing for example we organize meeting with farmers and in the first meetings we organized uh, we just had men and we had clearly to to tell them uh, like do do you have a partner does she work with you in the farm she can come and she can participate in the meeting it's not just for you and so uh, sometimes we really need this um, especially at the local level with uh, um, some communities we really need to have uh, an invitation uh, for the woman to participate and I believe that um, the generations coming um, now, they are much more outspoken, but still we need always to be aware that, um, that we give them space. And bright ideas can come from who care more about water. Like we, if Lesha would be in this call, she would give the example of the women managing water in Africa and that they would do much more for the community rather than the men that if the, the right to manage the water was given to the men. So I think that that's the, the extreme case, but I think in many different levels of the society, we should give more opportunity to, to women to speak up. And sometimes you really need to um, give them the opportunity for them to, to lose, um, to not be afraid to make mistakes and come out and say speak their minds and 
as uh, Bern said, sometimes we'll make mistakes. Everyone does, and that's how we learn. And yeah, that's that's what I th and I think is the same also for youth. Um, I believe that there is a, a huge power that can be unleashed by youth if you give them uh, the possibility to experiment and make mistakes. So as the only woman in this panel, what I can say is that things are um, improving and we are having more opportunities now to speak uh, compared to the past, but I think we are not there yet. Back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, Paul, any thoughts on, on that aspect yourself? Thank you. Um, I, I think in the, um, uh, again, I like looking at it from the uh, African lens, so to speak. Um, what the youth actually um, need and what they want is just to be included. Uh, we luckily have a youth population and uh, by extension a women population that are so empowered, very skilled, very driven, and that are willing to make changes and to uh, create an impact. Actually, in, in the case of Africa, where the average um, age is actually getting lower and lower, we might find ourselves, uh, say, by the year 2050, where the average age falls you know, within the youth bracket. And, and that presents an opportunity, an opportunity for us to look at the youth and uh, women particularly as drivers uh, rather than just the enablers. I think uh, we need to change that perspective and, and, and uh, allow them the opportunity to do what they really need to do, which is exactly driving the case of uh, sustainability and pushing the change that we need. In any case, uh, I think the youth and women usually suffer the consequences of the actions or inactions of uh, the other sort of uh, decision makers who falls outside of those brackets. So having them work uh, side by side with us, I think would be very, very central to the overall uh, objective of the World Water Quality Alliance, but also across the agenda of sustainability. Thank you, Richard. Thank you to, thank you, Paul, and thank you to all of you uh, for your contributions. Uh, an hour and a half has gone by extremely quickly, and I've enjoyed listening to all of you very much indeed. That's why I chose you guys. So, so thank you very much. So thank you very much for that. As a white haired, well, if I had hair, I don't have hair, but if I had hair, it would be white, a uh, middle aged man who's not actually from the Mediterranean, uh, who was uh, born in England, but has the pleasure of living here in the Mediterranean and working here. Um, let me. Let me also say somebody who makes mistakes and who's which Angela and Bernd have pointed out that making mistakes allows you to learn. I, believe me, have learned an awful lot in my life as a result of that. Um, I would just like to make a final appeal to all those who are listening to us. First of all, to thank you to all those who have been listening to us, but more than anything as well, to appeal to you. The World Water Quality Alliance is an inclusive concept. The idea of the World Water Quality Alliance is to bring on board uh, stakeholders, people, non-professionals, professionals, professionals uh, uh, scientists together with ordinary citizens, ordinary citizens together with local politicians and regional politicians and national politicians, and those politicians as well, together with the leaders of industry or the owner of a bakery on a corner shop. We want absolutely everybody to become involved in the most vital issue probably of the 21st century, which is the issue of water. We want you to not only become aware of the problems, we want you to become an active part of the solution. And I hope that the World Water Quality Alliance and the creation of that alliance and through its social engagement uh, platform, which is able to be able to disseminate the actions and to involve you, will inspire you to come to us. 
please contact us, please join us and become involved in this issue. Um, not only will you gain, but we as a society will gain uh, from your involvement. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Good night to all of you. Have a very good weekend. And above all, in these times of pandemic, please all of you stay very, very healthy and happy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.